I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate on the occasion of the Government introducing the Climate Change Action Bill here to the Dáil. The Bill is an important element of the programme for Government and obviously was a crucial element too of Government formation talks. The Bill primarily sets out how the whole of Government can, must and will confront climate change, reduce emissions, how it will provide and ensure for real actions and commitments to match Ireland's promise and signature to the Paris Accord. The Bill provides a focused procedure and set of processes which is new to Irish governments when seeking to address climate change. In recent years and decades, we've flittered around it. We've flattered to deceive. Yes, there's been some progress, but not nearly enough to match previous commitments and previous signatures to previous accords. When you think of the social change that we've witnessed in this country in the last 10 years, and the fact that it was indeed slow even to realise or materialise. But when the various Oireachtas committees, and the various Oireachtas debates and motions were taking place, and when the Citizens' Assembly recommendations was then put before special Oireachtas hearings and scrutiny, further scrutiny took place, all the while the younger generation were demanding to participate to force their opportunity, to force an opportunity for them to dominate that debate. And ultimately it was them who convinced many of the rest of the population to pass both referenda. Many of us, and we all in fact, reveled in their participation. We welcomed and admired them, and especially thanked them for such participation. And we hoped that they would involve themselves in future such debates, future such decisions for the country, whether it be social or economical indeed. And it is that generation, and indeed a younger one, that dominates this subject matter and demands action. The last election was dominated by a number of issues, predominantly housing, health, balanced regional development and climate change. The electorate naturally expects the government elected subsequently by the Dáil to address and place emphasis on these issues. We provided for the largest ever monetary provision in relation to our efforts to address the social and affordable housing situation. We have an opportunity too, like never before, to invest and finally invest the sort of funding that is necessary, both in acute and community health services, by building on the goodwill the endeavour and the life-saving actions of all those who have worked so diligently and so with such effort and commitment in the health service during the course of the pandemic. We've also heard in recent weeks how the government will seek to augment and support remote working, to provide e-hubs in many towns and villages across the country which otherwise need and deserve such action and such an opportunity presented and it is one of the good things that has come out of the pandemic, obviously. And now, at this stage, we can build and act on the climate change credentials of this government with this bill. And it wasn't just the Greens, either, that spoke of or participated in or commented on their aspirations or their party's aspirations in relation to the country's commitment in the Paris Accord. I even noted here last week Michael Healy Ray say that he's not a climate denier. But what many of these have success successfully denied to date is their failure to inform the rest of the electorate, to inform the rest of the House what specific measures would they make, or would they initiate, or would they participate in, in order to meet our commitments? Would they deny the Paris Accord? Would they, by association, deny this country the type of international investment that is there for the taking in relation to measures and methods and initiatives in the provision, for example, of alternative energies. But in the absence of those specifics, many of them shout loudest, shriek loudest for extra funding to deal with flood relief schemes caused by the very issues that we seek to address tonight. Shout and shriek loudest for increased funding towards REP schemes in agriculture. Again, 
that too has become much of an income support rather than the initiative for which it was measured in the first instance. And we hope the new scheme and the opportunities presented by CAP will afford this government an opportunity to make real inroads there and offer real opportunities for increased income for farm families. We also hear many shriek and shout loud for exceptional payments over and above what's there presently in relation to house adaptation grants, for example, again as a result of the pressures caused uh, by global warming and climate change. The bill places obligations and responsibilities and an onus on each government department to specifically commit to and account for and contribute to the whole of government targets on reducing emissions. They'll be part of carbon budgets with projected actions on a five-year basis and will be responsible and accountable, of course, to the Dáil. And this too will complement and assure our credibility when we're seeking that sort of investment from international sources into our economy. Such funding from international sources and international pensions and the like is now exclusively dependent on sustainable practices and government pathway towards necessary emission reductions. Such ethics is now a reality. Our economy, let alone our environment, cannot ignore that reality. But that's not to say that the road ahead is an easy one. That's not to say that change will be seamless. It's not to say that the entire population or sectors within it get it or are on the same page. So to make this process easier, workable, achievable, and to garner the results craved economically and socially, government must show leadership, offer hope, bring people together, offer assistance, help, entice, assure and reward the sort of change that is necessary. We must seek to engender an attitude, a feeling, a belief that we can come out of climate change actions far better off than we went into them. Many have spoken here and do regularly about the challenges faced and facing agriculture. But few acknowledge the advancements, the progress and the leadership to date provided by that sector. The agricultural industry, the food and drink industry, remains one of our greatest assets and exports. It retains its status as a world leader because of its ability to adapt and to change, its ability to embrace, to embrace diversity, adapt to consumer sentiments, explore new markets and deliver quality product. The lazy argument that it must simply reduce the national herd to play its role is exactly that, lazy and absurd. The growing world population, the growing world markets means our projects must keep pace. And it can do so as other industries can, by adapting and aligning production systems to environmental ambition and by recognising, embracing and employing new sciences and innovation to meet that demand. When I talk of government offering hope, of assistance, of help, initiatives and incentives and rewards, I consider or would have considered the example that can be shown or should have been shown to date by energy transition in Offaly and the Midlands. The accelerated decarbonisation process, including cessation of peat extraction, meant that the government was under severe pressure to provide and cater for a just transition in the last two years. I envisage funding addressing the effects of cessation and change with improved educational and retraining opportunities, potential to be derived from alternative energy options and proposals and solutions. I would have expected us to champion innovation amongst other projects within the counties impacted its themselves. Such a positive experience for us in my county and region could and should be an example to other regions and sectors. But unfortunately, I'm extremely sorry to say that this hasn't been our experience to date. It's essential, therefore, that parallel to this bill's journey through the Oireachtas, that this government convene or reconvene department officials who have responsibility in this area, the Just Transition Commissioner, Kieran Mulvey, whose reports issued following extensive consultation with relevant stakeholders, and his reports are representative of the, amb the ambition that exists in our community, amongst its communities, and amongst public representatives too, such as myself. 
I committed to and sold Just Transition to my electorate. It's my duty, therefore, at this stage to call out the lack of progress and to insist on it being rectified as ASAP. It was with this mindset that I wrote to the Taoiseach last week on the commencement of this debate. And I'd like to take the opportunity to read the letter into the Dáil record, please. Dated, as I said last Wednesday, the 21st, dear Taoiseach, with the Climate Change Bill now published, I think it an opportune time to voice my disappointment, my frustration and no little anger at the ridic ridiculously slow, poorly administered and apparent inept governance and leadership and delivery of just transition to date. I was at the forefront of our party's commitment to establish and ensure that revenue raised from carbon taxes would fund just transition in areas and counties and regions most impacted by decarbonisation. Indeed, I championed the increase in carbon tax when a Fianna Fáil negotiator in relation to the budget of October 2018. We also insisted on fuel poverty provisions being included in that package to give it the sort of credibility the project deserved. The slow snail's pace and lack of progress to date is a far cry from where I'd expect it to be today. That's further compounded for me personally, considering Fianna Fáil being the lead party in government since June of last year. And it would appear that not having a cabinet member, for example, in Offaly, in Longford, Leash, Kildare, Westmead, Roscommon, or even East Galway is very evident and telling when it comes to just transition. In recent weeks, last Concord, I posed a series of questions to Minister Ryan on just transition matters. Unfortunately, the responses, rather than the answers, I might add, confirmed my fears and concerns. It is included in this letter I refer to. Those responses included confirmation that, one, not one job, I'm afraid, has been created by just transition funding. Only €166,000 has been drawn down to date. Three, the rules and terms associated with the proposed funding previously announced and lauded, and by me too, I might add, I'm afraid, do little to ensure that such funds will materialise at all. Four, the county most impacted by Bordemone and ESB job losses and economic damage, it being awfully, is not prioritised or benefiting as proportionately as I believe it should. There also appears to be a suggestion that the Midlands, regional, the Midlands region be extended even further for the purpose of the EU Just Transition Fund, further diluting the impact on communities most affected. Five, the Midlands Regional Transition Team is merely a sounding board with no real powers, despite recommendations to the contrary by Kieran Mulvey, myself and others. It would appear too that the Department is actually depriving Bordemon and ESB staff of upskilling opportunities that match the jobs the Just Transition Fund may create, as they won't share any of the details of these employment opportunities that they have sought to enter into. Six, there's no decision on the potential community gain arising from either A, the Department's consideration or investigation into the future use of the now defunct power stations at Lanesbury and Shannon Bridge. There's been no um, response to my recommendation where I asked the local authorities would act as administrators in seeking an open tender competition to determine the future use of those plants that might yield a community, social and economic gain. And concurrently, concurrently, the ESB are seeking a refund from the energy regulator of the €5 million Euro it supposedly gifted just transition when it was announcing the closures in the first place. It's also seeking further millions from the same source to cover costs of its exit. And of course, notwithstanding the above, there's the ongoing failure of still not having put in place a greatly expanded programme of home heating retrofit options. Thus, by doing so, neglecting the very people impacted greatest by the suddenness of decarbonisation. Meanwhile, in the midst of this lack of progress, we're seeing the ongoing and indeed growing importation of peat products for horticulture and home heating fuel purposes. This is making a laugh and a mockery of just transition process altogether. It sought a meeting to discuss Just Transition some months ago, 
and I still await a date for same. In the meantime, Taoiseach, you can see from this short appraisal the obvious social, economic and political ramifications of poor progress on these matters to date. Last concorde, that was the end of the letter, by the way. Last concorde, and ministers indeed, I wish this bill every success. I wish the process of its passage success and expect that the interaction and the engagement by members of both houses will improve the bill and give it the type of ownership that's required to ensure its then leadership can deliver on its intent. I especially hope the update I've given to the House this evening in relation to just transition, I especially hope that you will recognise that that's the view emanating from the relevant stakeholders, from ESB Bordenomona workers of today, from ESB Bordenomona workers of the past, of pensioners, of their families, of their community, all their communities, and the county and the region. And it's also the view of other representatives, of all parties and none, whether they're councillors in the locality, whether it's my own colleague, Deputy Nolan, you know, when we're elected to this doll, irrespective of your background, irrespective of your party or your affiliation, your duty is to those that give you the privilege to be here. And this was the major issue in our constituency. And we'll work together, as it's expected of our electorate, to ensure that this government responds properly and effectively and based on the commitments it made two years ago, but has an opportunity to recommit to them in the context of this bill and this debate and has the opportunity to rectify the measures which have not been successful to date and are unworkable to date. And that's why I said earlier, and I, I ask again, that the Minister present bring back to the Department the aspiration and the wish and the demand we are making for the relevant stakeholders, as I said, in relation to the Department, in relation to the Just Transition Commissioner and public representatives who have a duty to respond to the needs and the aspirations, as I said, of those we are given the privilege to represent. And we want to be there to ensure that the changes that are necessary, as I said, are made as quick as is possible. And like I said earlier, there's every potential for that example to be a great one to others. There's every potential for us to come out of this process and come out of these actions that are necessary far better than we went into them. As I said as well, the prospect of international investment, the prospect of international financiers and pensions invested in this country is dependent on our commitment to what's contained within this bill, on various sectors living up to the expectations, but doing so in a real and meaningful manner, that they won't be browbeaten into it, they won't be forced to do this, that or other, that there's a, a, a commitment on the part of everybody that is here to recognise that and to work together to ensure that the bill is real, is meaningful and can deliver to all the sectors whom fear presently the impact they may have, may have because of it.